Hi folks, welcome back to Game Geeks. I'm your host, Kurt Weagle. Today's episode, something we've never actually done before. For those of you who complain that all we do is Savage Worlds or Fate, the occasional BRP or Pathfinder thrown in there, we're going to be talking about the Esoterrorists by Pelgrim Press, written by Robin Laws, recent winner of the Diana Jones Award. Congrats, Robin. Esoterrorists, or Esoterrorists, just depending on how you want to say it, is a gumshoe-fueled game. Gumshoe is its own system that sort of came out of Robin Laws' frustration with how a lot of clue-bearing and mystery-supported games treat their clues and their trigger paths for plot. The idea behind it is, and there's a rationale for this in front of all of the Gumshoe books, most of which we'll be reviewing in the near future, the rationale behind this is mystery games should not use clues like treasure. They should not use clues like combat, where you have to fight your way through something to get a clue that is important for you to proceed with the mystery and proceed with the plot. What ends up happening there as the GM is if you have something hidden in someone's spot hidden check that no one manages to make in that room, then you have to find a way to vamp for the next 30 minutes to get them back on track and to get them to where they need to go to see the next horror and the next piece of the mystery. Rather than fight your way through that quagmire, you can use the gumshoe system which automatically gives the core clues to the players that they need to progress through the story. Now, these core clues are discovered through a battery of investigative abilities. Now, the investigative abilities themselves range everywhere from what you would probably expect in, in a game such as this, including bullshit detector, which is telling what people are lying to you, flattery, flirting, reconnaissance and streetwise, all the way to things like forensic accounting, fingerprinting, explosive devices, chemistry, cryptography, all of these, you automatically succeed if you buy this skill. Now, one of the quirks of this is during character creation, everyone needs to have every one of those skills. So occasionally you'll end up with something along the lines of no one in the party has anything in forensic entomology. Uh, sure, uh, former... SAS Special Forces Officer, you have a rank in Forensic Entomology. Why? He likes bugs. But as long as everyone has one rank in the investigative abilities, then you get the core clue. Extra clues can be gained by spends in the investigative abilities. So you might have a pool of two. Now that sounds pretty low for those of us who are used to throwing around double digits on our dice rolls, but A, Randomization of this is based off of a D6, and it indeed is rarely done during the investigative portion of a game because clues should be given out. And B, a rating of one implies really high levels of mastery of that particular subject. We're talking the cast of bones level mastery here. Rankings of two or higher have are a level of expertise rarely seen among humankind. So once you get your clues, your core clues and your ancillary clues that you can then use to proceed through the plot, the rest of the engine itself is based off of the general skills. Now these are things like scuffling, your athletics, driving, etc. This is generally done based off of a D6 plus however many of your pool you want to spend on an attribute toward a target number that you probably don't know based on the GM and the circumstances in general. That way it does leave a little bit of mystery, should I add two or three from my pool to do this? Well, how important is, is the role for you? Is there, so there's a certain mini game from that angle of the game itself. Pools for general abilities tend to and indeed should be considerably higher because not everyone's going to have a scuffling of one, which means eh, eh. That's the basis of the gumshoe system itself. What Esoterrorist brings to the table is you are people who are involved in fighting Esoterrorists, which is the name of the organization of bad guys in this, who are determined to bring the dark, unnatural, supernatural into our world. It's an opposition called the Outer Dark. And this is everything that Stephen King, H.P. Lovecraft, Geiger, and David Cronenberg have ever dreamed up. 
One of the things I really like about this game is the fact that it gives a real reason for wanting to stop the spread of supernatural information among the norms of the setting. Instead of just panning off of the, everyone has this really obscure sense of amnesia a la Buffy, sure, the vampires that were killing everyone were gang members with sharpened teeth or sewer gas out, uh, or swamp gas from the sewers again, or something like the X-Files and conspiracy settings because we're profiting off of this and we don't want to share. The idea behind the esoterics is the more people that see these supernatural events and are frightened by them become to understand that they are real, which weakens the boundary between our world and the next, which weakens the membrane, which weakens the call, which means more things can come through, which sort of gives you this evil cascade where the boundaries fall and the outer dark takes over our world. Your job is to shut these things down and occasionally do terrible things so that people don't find out that all of this is real. It gives a nice plot from which to hang your hat rather than just, oh, creepy shit happens and we're scared of it. One of the other things that this game gives you is the ability to set up your own town. It sort of gives you the ability to establish your own setting for this at different levels of horror and the people in town who may or may not be involved with the big bad guys and to what level. Are they fall on cultists? Are they pawns? Are they wannabes? Or are they innocent bystanders? There are a lot of gumshoe-powered games. These include, but are not limited to, Trail of Cthulhu, an alternative take on Lovecraftian role-playing. There are a lot of those these days. There's also Ashen Stars, which is a science fiction approach. You've got Knights Black Agents, which is super spies versus vampires, not as strange as you'd think. And additionally, you have such worthies as Mutant City Blues, which combines cop procedurals like NYPD Blue with superpowers. Most of these will be getting a review in the near future here on Game Geeks. I like Esoterrorist quite a bit. The gumshoe system can take quite a bit to wrap your brain around, especially if you're used to something a bit more gamey where there's no roll, make a notice roll in a gumshoe system. You automatically succeed at the important notice rolls. So that requires you to re-gear your brain to a certain extent. But I think the other things that it buys you, the emphasis on the monstrosities, not as much as archetypes of what we're accustomed to, but more along the lines of body horror and outer dark horror, the ability to set up your own town, etc., that make this quite worth the price of admission. There's a supplement for this that is damned creepy called the Book of Unremittent Horror, which gives you a variety of monsters and other foes to throw at your players that don't rely on standard tropes. You will not find any sort of weird boar, wolf, jaguar, bat, lizard in there, but you'll find things like the organ grinder, as well as some extremely creepy pretext of it, the, the sort of the background flavor that gives you a really good idea of how to incorporate this into the game. One of them being the viral lost video of a metal band that was only played once, but everyone's heard of it. It gives a real Blair Witch feel to it. So this is the end of our Esoterrorist review. We want to remind you, if you haven't done so already, please go check out our fundraising drive. You can find it on GameGeeksRPG.com. We want to give a shout out to our first donors. These are the first people to step up and, step up and really help us out with this. Matt Drive, Robert, Blanch, Robert Branch, Gerald Sirocco, and Last Summer Productions. You might remember them from way, way, way back in the early days of Game Geeks where we reviewed... Ebon Storms, which is an original fantasy audio drama, which I was involved in back in 1995, I think. Wow, how things come full circle. And, and finally to Jonah Shaw, who has been a good friend of the show for quite a while. We're doing great. We're getting close. And once we hit to the 2000 mark, we're going to start editing in HD. For those of you who have donated, we're not going to throw up a thank you until we get to HD because we thought nothing would be quite as squirrely as, hey, I donated for HD, but I can barely read my name on it there. So thanks again for donating. We really appreciate it. For Game Geeks, I'm your host, Kurt Weagle. Good day and good gaming.